Hello, this is Dr. Lugo, and today we're going to talk about cardiovascular pharmacology. So let's go ahead and get started. This first slide shows all the classes of drugs we're going to study today. Onotropes has several included that we typically use in the operating room. Um, some we do not. These are the different mechanisms, as you can see, in the different receptors that they partake, and we're going to talk about most of these individually very soon. This is an overall picture of how some of the receptors work. We're dealing with calcium as well as some of the secondary messaging. Specific for the beta agonist mechanism, there's the beta 1 receptor, causes a GS protein for adenylocyclase, cyclic AMP, PK, and phosphorylation. Then you get calcium influx, you increase your calcium, and this activates this coupling. Also of importance to note that this helps increase calcium reuptake, which is important for diastole or lusotropy, which is relaxation of the myocardium. Beta-1 receptors predominate on the heart. There are some beta-2 receptors, which are predominantly in the peripheral vasculature and bronchial smooth muscle, and they relax those. Catecholamines. These drugs are very quick on, very quick off. So when we do use them, we're actually a lot of times given several boluses or we start infusions in the operating room. Digitalis, this is an older medication. Its mechanism inhibits sodium potassium ATPase, which essentially increases your available calcium, which helps with contraction and sometimes can be help control arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation. That being said, the drug itself can cause arrhythmias. Um, it has a low therapeutic index. And something of note is when you do have digitalis toxicity, the drugs of choice are as follows. There's an antibody that combined to it, lidocaine safe, magnesium, fentoin, and then fix any low potassium, which can make things worse. Epinephrine is a common drug that we have in the ORs and we use for many of the difficult cases we have it available it has three receptors as beta ones beta twos and alpha ones the way to remember this is with the beta twos is somebody with anaphylaxis we get the dilation of the bronchoconstriction that's occurring at the same time so we give it to increase your mean arterial pressures um, we give it to help with the bronchodilation we give this drug in cardiac arrest other uses is asthma, bradycardia, prolonged local anesthetics. Uh, for asthma, usually it's 0.5 milligrams subcutaneous is the dose that we give. Um, in low doses, it hits more beta receptors. The higher doses, you get more alpha receptors. Side effects of note, you do get hypokalemia because of the shift due to the beta receptors, as well as some hyperglycemia. And these drugs are also arrhythmogenic. Dobutamine has beta-1 and beta-2 agonism properties. So the beta 1s will increase your contractility, and with the beta 2s you get some decrease in SVR. Um, these are primarily used for stress echo with patients with heart failure, and we do use these in the OR sometimes too for patients after uh, heart transplants or needing help with their contractility in the operating room. Isoproteranol also has beta 1 and beta 2 agonism. Um, it's very similar to dobutamine. It's, it's not used as frequently in the operating rooms, but it is available if you ever do need it and the places where you're tested on it is after heart transplants and unstable bradycardia it's indicated because you will get a very high heart rate dopamine is an interesting drug because of the, the various receptors it has and depends on the dose of your dopamine you'll hit these different receptors so you start out with dopamine you increase your dose to get beta ones and later on you get alpha ones there is a diuretic and natriuretic effect with dopamine However, it does not improve renal failure outcomes in surgery or in the ICU. So once upon a time, renal dose dopamine was used in the ICU. It is still used, but not specifically to help improve renal function after surgery. Side effects specifically are the arrhythmia, arrhythmias that can occur, and especially atrial fibrillation um, that we worry about. This drug is not used in the USA. It's calcium sensitizer, but it does need to be mentioned, just so you've heard of it. Ionodilator is a drug that will increase your contractility, but also dilate some of the blood vessels. 
this specific one that we use quite frequently in the ORs and people with right heart failure is milrinone. It's phosphodesterase 3 inhibitor. It inhibits the breakdown of cyclic AMP, which enhances our calcium release, which gets your anotropy. Also with this, as mentioned, you will get some vasodilation. Amnerone used to be used, but it's no longer used due to thrombocytopenia. As mentioned, milrinone is a drug that we use. It increases with your contractility, so it'll help your cardiac index. It's great for right heart failure or any type of heart failure. Arrhythmia is the most common side effect with this drug. Vasopressors are drugs that are used to help increase your blood pressure. We have alpha-1 and um, V1 receptors. The mechanism essentially is related to an increase in calcium release and increase in calcium influx. So the other medicines we're going to talk about are norepinephrine, ephedrine, and vasopressin. Norepinephrine is an alpha-1 as well as a beta-1 agonist. It is a comparable to epinephrine, but more intense with the alpha-1. And this is the drug of choice for septic shock. Phenylephrine is a alpha-1 agonist. It is not a catecholamine. It's a drug of choice for mild hypotension in the operating room when you have a normal or higher heart rate. Side effect can be a decreased cardiac output because it can increase in SVR and reflex bradycardia. Veteran has direct and indirect effects, alpha-1, beta-1s, and beta-2s. After several doses, you can get some tachyphylaxis because you're depleted norepinephrine stores. Vasopressin responds to V1 receptor agonists and is used in septic shock, cardiac arrest, vasoplegia. And it's a good drug for these because in a sick environment, vasopressin works very well. The side effects can be high doses. You can have intense vasoconstriction, which can further increase in acidosis. And then you can get some effects on the V2 receptors, which are responsible for ADH and water retention. Vasodilators are nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, and then the other ones mentioned below. How do these drugs work? Well, essentially we have nitric oxide stimulating guanylate cyclase, which through a cascade ends up causing vascular relaxation. Nitroprusside is specific more for the arterial dilation as opposed to venous dilation. It's very rapid on and offset. Side effects are reflex tachycardia, increase in dead space, and too much nitroprusside for too long, you can get cyanide toxicity. So what happens if you get cyanide toxicity? It's not good. So it's first detected by the three things, tachyphylaxis, metabolic acidosis, as well as increased mixed venous oxygen saturation. And the treatment is sodium thiosulfate, sodium nitrate, and hydroxycobalamin. And what you're doing with these is thiocyanate is not as bad as cyanide, and, or is meth hemoglobin, or vitamin B12. Nitroglycerin does more venodilation, so it can help decrease preload. It can be used for a coronary vasodilator, as well as a uterine relaxant. And tachyphylaxis can occur with this as well. If you give too much over too long, you can have some methemoglobin. And the treatment of choice is methylene blue for this. Hydralazine will cause vascular relaxation by increasing the influx of potassium first, causing hyperpolarization, eventually leading to the release of nitric. Side effect for this is lupus, and it's usually if you're a slow acetylator. Calcium channel blockers, they bind to the L-type voltage channels and inhibit the calcium influx. These are the common ones that we see in the ORs for these type of channels. Clonidine is alpha-2 agonist, and this causes a reduction in cyclic AMP, hyperpolarization, as well as a decrease in intracellular calcium, and this causes a decrease in blood pressure. It is not as specific for alpha-2 
2s as dexmetomidine. Um, it can be as an adjunct for a regional anesthesia. And then there are some sedation properties to it. And withdrawal, you can get some severe rebound hypertension. BNP has some natriuretic effects uh, causing vasodilation. The ACE inhibitors and angiotensin blockers, their mechanism as follows in this diagram. They can block the enzyme or the hormone at different pathways. ACE inhibitors decrease the conversion, reducing the vasoconstrictor effects. They also block the breakdown of bradykinin, and that's where you get the cough, which you don't get from the ARBs. Side effects of note are hyperkalemia and refractory hypertension after surgery, especially with cardiac surgery. ARBs block the angiotensinogen 1 receptors, and once again, there's no cough side effect with these. Some anti-anginal drug um, or drugs that would decrease the oxygen demand increase the supply. So nitro, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and then renolazine is used for chronic, chronic angina, reduces intercellular sodium and calcium to accumulate during ischemia. The last drugs we're going to talk about today are the antiarrhythmics. There's four classes, one, two, three, and four, and then we'll briefly mention adenosine at the end of this. So this is a, a diagram with the sodium channels for phase zero of the depolarization. Then we get early repol with potassium channels, and they plateau with calcium channels. Later repolarization with potassium channels, and then back to baseline. This is occurring in the ventricular muscles. Class 1 are the sodium channel blockers, or the membrane stabilizers. Um, 1A has procanamide, quinidine, and diisoperidamide, and there's their uses. Lidocaine is a 1B, and flecainide is a 1C. And all these drugs, even though they're antiarrhythmics, they can all cause arrhythmias. Class 2 are beta blockers and they depress the SA and AV nodes, decrease conduction, automaticity, and prolong atrial refractory periods. Class three are potassium channel blockers. They increase action potential duration in cardiac myocytes, prolong refractory period. These drugs help convert AFib to normal sinus, and they maintain somebody in sinus from the AFib. Immunoron also has a sodium and beta blocker properties as well. Once again, these all can cause arrhythmias, as well as usual pre prolongation of the QT. Class 4 calcium channel blockers. These uh, slow the L type channels. We the two classic ones are dutiazem and rapamil. Adenosine is another antiarrhythmic, it stimulates the pure energic receptors, causing hyperpolarization, as well as blocking calcium entry. And they do have some coronary vasodilator properties. It's very quick onset, and the half-life is less than 10 seconds. Uh, Theophylline antagonizes P1 and 2, and uptake into the coronary endothelial cells are inhibited by diapyridamol. I just want to mention a few examples of these drugs. Um, that we commonly see and use in operating rooms. Uh, in general, class 1 and 3 are for ventricular arrhythmias, and class 2 and 4 are for atrial arrhythmias, which, to remind those are the beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers. So some of the sinus tachycardia, we typically use beta blocker. Um, idiopathic rhythm, ectopic atrial tachycardia, calcium channel blockers are appropriate. Torsades, we classically give magnesium. Detalis, uh, causing delayed um, after depolarizations, we can use calcium channel blockers. SVT, once we do a vagal maneuver, adenosine seems to be the drug of choice. And for refractory VFib, amniodarone and, and then lidocaine is your second choice. These are the references. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day.